some canning today. The members of our group, Safe Canning, on Safe Canning by the Book on Debbie's Back Porch, uh, has asked us to do some canning, and even though this is not my normal canning season, if there is such a thing as a canning season, I do have some beef um, that needs to be canned, and so I'm going to take this opportunity to go through canning hot pack uh, beef. Uh, on Debbie's back porch, we advocate safe canning, and I thought during this process, during the times when I'm working, that I would take the opportunity to answer a few questions on safe canning. Uh, I posed this question to people in the group, and they gave me a list of things they thought that might be very important to share with you about safe canning. And I may not get them all shared today, but I'll do another video later and we'll talk about some more of them. Uh, on Debbie's Back Porch, we use uh, National Center for Home Food Preservation directions and instructions, or BALL, either the BALL Complete Book of Home Canning or the BALL Blue Book. There are other places that have uh, safe canning directions and recipes, but truly they aren't, there aren't that many. Uh, most of the groups, the videos, the sites um, where you can go looking for recipes will have one or two recipes that are not approved uh, or not tested and therefore not approved. And so unless you've really done a lot of studying and thinking about it, you might end up making one and then be sorry. Uh, one of the recipes that's not tested and approved. And so, we're going to start our canning, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as I work. Um, I, I will tell you now, if, if you don't subscribe to and practice uh, safe canning, or you don't know that there is a difference in safe and untested, um, some of this might be kind of a surprise to you. Some of it may not be. Um, but we're going to give it a shot. We're going to try to talk about how to be safe in your canning and make sure that the food you can and serve to your family is food that will nourish them um, and that you feel really good about feeding them. So I'll be back in just a minute and we'll get started. Okay. When you're canning, preparation is very, very important. I, I spend as much time in preparation uh, as I do actually canning. Not necessarily the time for canning uh, the product, but in, in putting it together to can. So, what I'm doing now is I am wiping the inside of my rings with vinegar. I may be the only person you've ever seen that do that, that does that. I don't know. Uh, but it's a habit I got into uh, years ago when I first uh, started looking at Tatler lids. The first couple of times I used Tatler lids, I had some seal failures, not many, but a couple. And I took the time to look at each seal that failed and to determine why it failed. And most of the time if I had a seal fail, it was because there was some rust inside my ring. And I know we all look at our rings and we try to make sure they are rust free. But you know, I, I've, I've never actually been able to go through mine and find enough that didn't have at least a tiny little spot of rust. So, I think that an extra step is needed and I started wiping the inside with vinegar. Uh, even though these have been washed and they've been through the dishwasher. So, one of the first little tips I will give you is clean the inside of your rings, of your bands with vinegar and that has helped me a lot. I'll knock on wood 
I almost never have a seal fail. And I use just whatever lids I have. As I've gathered them, I've moved more and more almost totally to Tattlers. Because I love the idea of not throwing it away. And that may be the first thing, safe canning tip that I'll share is never, ever, ever reuse a metal lid. And you're going to have some people say, oh, well, I do reuse them uh, only after I've inspected them and made sure that they're fine. And I just use them water back, whatever. Don't reuse a metal band. It wasn't made to be reused. Uh, the food that we put in these jars is too expensive, too hard to get. Most of what I can is produce that we grow, not everything, but most. That's hard work. Even if it's work you enjoy, it's hard work. And there is no way that I would ever reuse a, a metal lid just because I value my work more than that. So never ever use them to can again, to re never ever reuse lids to can again. Uh, you can use them for your uh, dry storage. You can use them for decorations. You can use them for many things, but never use them, never reuse them to can. I have here two pretty good sized pieces of beef that I think would benefit from canning. I, I can beef that is like a chuck roast or a shoulder roast, something you would make a pot roast or stew beef with. I also have a brisket and I'm canning it because we buy meat uh, in bulk, grass fed beef and the brisket has been in the freezer for about six months. And it's going to be a while before I cook it, cook one before I need a brisket. So I'm going to can it because I don't want it to uh, stay in the freezer much longer. And because brisket is a meat that's hard to cook properly to make it tender. And I, you know, some people can just do wonders with a brisket. And I'm okay with it. But I actually think we will get better use out of it if I can it. So... The National Center for Home Food Preservation directions call for you to cut the meat up. And Ball's directions, by the way, are a little bit different, not a whole lot different. Um, either way, it's perfectly safe. But I'm going to cut this up, cut off any large pieces of fat. I find that easier to do as I go. And I don't throw it away. I will render it and use it for something most likely to make a seed ball for the birds, a suet ball. Uh, give them to my chickens. You don't have to cut off every single little bit, but you want to cut off most of the fat. And you can cut it in strips or in chunks. And I'm going to cut this in the size piece that I would use for beef stew, and from it I can make stew beef, beef stew, I can make um, stroganoff, I can just make beef chips and gravy, many things I can do with it. So while I'm cutting, which I know is like watching paint dry, uh, let me give you another safe canning tip, something you might see people do that you really shouldn't. Uh, cabbage. There is no safe approved way to can cabbage except in pickled products. So if you like to put cabbage in your vegetable soup and then can it, you really shouldn't. You should put the cabbage in when you actually prepare the food to serve. Cabbage is, um, cabbage leaves are thicker than other green leaves. They have a different texture. They don't necessarily always can all the way through, heat all the way through the way, say, collard greens would or spinach. So, 
containing cabbage is not uh, an approved uh, method. Now if you want to chop up your cabbage and pickle it, you can do that. And if you want to make kraut, which is my favorite, you can do that. Uh, later on we're going to have a kraut video. And I will show you how to make small batch kraut. But as far as canning goes, there are no safe approved directions for any product other than pickled products that include cabbage. Next safe canning tip. Water bath versus pressure canner. When is it okay to do green beans in a water bath? Only if they're pickled. Unless you've pickled your green beans, there is no amount of time that you can water bath them that will render them safe. Render them assuredly safe. Anything that's considered low acid, which is everything except most fruits, not all fruits by the way, melons don't fall into that. Melons are pretty low acid. But most fruits are high acid and can be water bathed. Tomatoes are marginally high, uh, high acid. That's why you must add some acid in the form of lemon juice or citric acid in order to safely water bath uh, tomatoes. So anything else, unless it's pickled, and unless it's approved to be pickled, must be cooked in a pressure canner. Next safety tip. Can you can butter? Well, you could, but it very likely might not be safe. There's no approved method for canning butter. And if you are looking at a Facebook site and the person canning says, we're going to can butter. Now, I'm not telling you to do it because it's not approved, because it hasn't been tested. But it works for me, and this is how I do it. Be very careful when you hear that. Um, Whatever the theory is, uh, I have heard that the, the dairy lobby pays the USDA not to test butter. And that won't even hold past the common sense law. The dairy lobby doesn't care if you buy your butter 50 pounds at a time or one pound at a time. So they don't benefit from you not canning butter. Indeed, they might benefit if you did. Uh, some things are not tested and are not going to be tested because it makes no sense to test them. Uh, dairy is a product that does not hold up well to canning, uh, does not, cannot be assuredly rendered safe from canning, and butter is something that stores easily anyway for a long period of time. So. There are, none of the recipes you see, and none of the instructions you see on YouTube, on the internet, on websites, on blogs for canning butter is something that you can be assured is a safe way to preserve food for your family. Another question. What is open kettle canning? And is it safe? I have recently seen someone on YouTube doing open kettle canning. 
Uh, no, it is not safe. And I'll tell you why. The rationale for open kettle canning, which is heating your food up hot and putting it in hot jars and putting a lid on it and then just ending, just stop there. You've now poured hot food in a hot jar and put a lid on it. There was no sterilization and even if you boiled it for three hours in the movement from the pot to the jar, it's no longer sterilized. And a sealed jar does not guarantee a safe contents. If you put a lid on a hot jar and let it cool, it will seal. It doesn't matter what's in it. Uh, what I usually say is, I could make a jar seal on old sweat socks and razor blades. Put them in a hot jar with hot water and put a, a lid on it and let it seal. They're sealed, but they're not safe. So, cooking your tomatoes a long time and then putting in a jar, putting them in a jar and putting a hot lid on it is no different than cooking your tomatoes for a long time and sealing them up in Tupperware and putting them on the shelf and expecting that to be safe for a year or more. So no, if you see somebody open kettle canning, they don't understand the process of rendering food safe through canning. And I really would not uh, take advice from them. I mean, if indeed canning safely is your goal. I'm going to cut the rest of this up and I'll come back and we'll start the process. Uh, just so you know, I measured this meat before I started. I'm sorry, I weighed this meat before I started. It was a little over seven pounds. Uh, Seven pounds equals seven pints, but you don't actually get that much in a pint jar. So I have eight jars ready. I'm cutting away probably at least a pound. So I have eight jars ready, but I may end up needing um, one more, just to, according to how it cooks up. And that's something I generally do is have one more jar ready than I think I'm going to need. So when I get this all cut up, I'll be back. Okay, that's enough. Just enough to keep it from sticking. And this is a good cast iron skillet, so it's not really going to stick much anyway. So, let's put it in. Now, our goal here is not to cook the meat. And the goal is to uh, sear the meat brown it just a little bit. You can raw pack this. Just put it in chunks, add some salt, and go. But we like with beef the flavor that you get from browning it first. So this will only take a few minutes, but it may take more than one load so I'll come back to you as this process goes forward. Okay, the last of the beef that I'm searing is in the skillet. I have a bowl full here that's been drained. Um, we'll start canning. By the time I get this much in the canner, the rest of it will be ready. So a couple things to remember. Make sure you have all your tools before you start. We mentioned that. Um, I'm going to can this beef, this seared beef hot pack, covered in hot water. I find that that gives me a, a fine broth. It, it's great for beef stew. Uh, it's great for many things, beef chips and gravy over noodles, whatever you want to do with it. If you can it raw pack, which you can, there's nothing wrong with that, often you don't get enough broth to cover the meat. So with beef, I prefer hot pack. 
I do raw pack chicken pretty often because it makes great chicken salad, uh, chicken pot pie, whatever it is you want to do with it. Um, the ball book has uh, directions to make a, um, a broth out of the drippings in the skillet. If you want to try that, I have not tried it. You may love it. Or you can use your home can broth. Uh, you can use tomato juice. I wouldn't be putting a lot of spices in it. If you have your home can broth um, or if you use water, don't. This is for beef and a liquid. It's not for any vegetables you want to stuff in there. It's not for big garlic cloves. You don't want to be putting onions in it. You're canning beef. If you want to make soup or stew, find a recipe for soup or stew. This is canning beef. So, I have my jars with hot water in them in my roaster. I keep them hot that way. You can keep them hot uh, another way. You can just put them in your water bath or in your um, pressure canner. What you should not do ever is heat them up in the oven. The canning jars don't go in the oven. They don't go in the oven even if you just want to keep them there for a little while. The manufacturer says no, they don't. That's dry heat. It's uneven heat. It can cause uh, breakage. And oh my, no, you can't bake in canning jars safely. And if you thought you could, you're not getting your information from the right place. Okay. I'm not going to pack this really, really tight because I don't want it really, really tight. Um, I am going to add a half teaspoon, that's actually a little less than a half teaspoon of salt. We're going for a one inch head space. I have a funnel here that measures a one inch head space. Uh, I couldn't find my little green debubble tool. Uh, that's a perfect way to measure your head space. So we want a one inch head space. And we want to debubble. You can do this with anything plastic. And already it's looking like broth. This is vinegar and a paper towel. Clean it really good. And when you're canning meat, there's no way to get all the fat out. I got most of the fat off, but there's always going to be some fat. You want to make sure to clean really good, even around the top part of the inside uh, with vinegar. One of the problems with meat that causes uh, people failures sometimes is the fat climbs the sides inside during the processing. You want to make sure that you go in with very clean rims. I also rub my fingers, my finger around the top to make sure that there's no um, cracks or chips. Now, I'm using Tattlers. Tattlers are not like ball lids. And you know, I use this for the meat and I don't want that. So I'm going to get a fork to get out my morning. Tatters are unlike ball in that you must simmer them. With ball lids you don't have to simmer. Now I'm going to tell you what I just did. With tatlers you want to check and make sure that this fits snugly, that there's not a lot of play between the rim and the rubber ring. And that one seemed to have some play. It may have been used 20 times, I don't know. This one doesn't, it fits snugly. And you put it down. These are the lids that we cleaned with vinegar. Put it on. Finger tight, and then off a quarter inch. and in the canner.
My counter's already at a simmer. I just now turned the heat up high. We'll do a couple of these. Now I'm using pints because pints is a good size for us. Pints processed for 75 minutes, either raw or hot. And you can certainly do quarts if you prefer. It's just, I cook mostly for two people. And when I can, when I'm cooking for more, it's easier to open another jar than it is to um, save half of the jar when it's just for two. So I can many things in pints that other people prefer quarts. But I find that a pint of this seared beef and a pint of carrots, let me find a smaller one. We kind of like doing a puzzle here. And some potatoes and some peas and some of my bone broth is just the perfect size for beef stew. And it works just perfect for us. Okay, fill it to one inch. That make that's a little more than one inch. May go down a bubble. Now this meat will shrink some more. it's sticking up above an inch, but the jar is not full. There we go. And one of the reasons I hot pack is because I don't want the meat up above the broth. Okay. Check the rim. Just a little bit too full. And as I said earlier, that's very important with meat because you do not want the um, fat climbing the sides. I can't keep that down below, so I'm going to have to take it out. Okay, good and clean. Yes, I'm going to use all of my silverware. A tapper lid, a ring, check for the snug fit. Finger tight, back off a quarter inch in the can. Okay, here we go. I have seven pints. Um, this is an All American 921. I could have done two layers of pints if I wanted to do more. You line up the arrow with the arrow and you bolt it off on opposite sides. This is so that it seals level. Now I'm going to take you through an abbreviated process as this uh, canner does its thing. Right now I have the heat on as high as it'll go. I turned it up high just as I started putting the jars in. That way I won't get thermal shock. It's not, it's only at a simmer when I start. The All-American 921 has both a weight regulator and a gauge. Um, this particular canner, move a little, 
I don't have to have it checked because I go by the weight regulator, but it happens that the uh, dial gauge is exactly on, and I'll show you how that works as we go. Uh, our goal here in this video is to show you how to find the sweet spot uh, and uh, to show you how to process in a way that saves you electricity and that you don't use so much water that you um, boil it dry on a long process. I actually put four quarts in uh, most directions for most canners say three quarts or there's a mark inside. Um, I put four quarts because it's a 75 minute process uh, and it's okay, it won't hurt anything if you put four quarts in. But generally I don't use a lot of water because we work on getting the sweet spot right where it should be. So when we get a plume of steam coming out, I'll come back and show you the next step. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there is a steady plume of steam coming out of the vent hole. And when that happens, set your timer for 10 minutes. Now one of the things that I see wrong on many videos is there are some folks that start counting their time now or they put the weight on now. It's important that you let steam escape for 10 minutes. You're gonna, what you're doing here, the process is you're creating a partial vacuum inside this canner so that the temperature will reach 240 degrees that's the temperature at which low acid foods can be rendered safe uh, from botulism spores. It will kill the spores. If you don't get it to that temperature, the spores are not dead and later on they can develop toxin. So that's the purpose of, uh, of pressure canning. So we want to let uh, the steam fully escape for 10 minutes and then we will start uh, then we will put our weight on. We still don't start our timing, but we will put our weight on uh, and then get ready for the next step. Going off, we've been venting for 10 minutes. Um, we actually are already gaining a little pressure, but now I'm going to put the weight on. This is the weight for the All American. If you see, it's marked 5, 10, and 15. Your canner may have a different weight. Uh, it says on the back, remove before opening, which we'll talk about. Uh, but we're going to put this on 10 because I am under a thousand feet. Turn our timer off. And now we wait again. Um, there are several waiting steps in this, and I urge you not to skip any of them. Every one of them is important. At this point, we're waiting until the weighted gauge begins to rattle. Then I'll show you the next step. Well, there we go. We have a rattle. Now let's talk about the sweet spot. My stove is on high, which is 9. I'm going to turn this down right away to 4. Four is from experience where I know mine will rattle and I may turn it down just a little bit more. This doesn't have to rattle all the time. I have a gauge. I can see that I'm going to maintain 11 pounds. That's what your 10 pound, maintain, 10 pound weight maintains is 11 pounds. So this should rattle once or twice a minute. Uh, mostly it rides on the steam to maintain the, um, the proper pressure inside. So now I'm going to set my timer for 75 minutes. I'll watch this. If I'm getting more than a couple rattles a minute, I'll turn it down a little bit more. And with a long time, a long process time, like 75 minutes, uh, I often do end up turning it down to two. 
uh, you'll have to find that spot on your stove and I suggest that you try it with an empty canner or a, a canner full of, of jars full of water just so that you can find that spot that maintains 11 pounds pressure without releasing too much steam um, and this is a, a very important thing to learn to help uh, cut down on siphoning in your jars. We all get some siphoning, but the, the less the better. And finding the sweet spot and processing at the lowest possible temperature in order to maintain the proper pressure is one way of controlling siphoning. Okay, just want to let you see that it's dancing just a little too happy. I'm going to turn it down just a little bit more. I'm turning it from four to two, which is what is my sweet spot on a longer process. We're maintaining the right temp the right pressure, and this is riding on the steam, and it needs to just give me a little rattle or two a minute. It doesn't need to rattle all the time. I just want to check in with you. We still have 42 minutes to go. And you can see the rattler is just riding on the steam, the weight regulator, and we're holding 11 pounds pressure steady. You don't hear a big rattling in my house but we're processing properly and my stove is down on two which two out of nine so it doesn't take an awful lot to keep your pressure right where it's supposed to be now if you have a canner that has just a dial gauge you've probably already figured out how low you have to turn it but a lot of folks that use just a weight regulator tend to let it rattle way too much which means you're processing at a higher heat than you need to your canner's fine it's not going to go over pressure but you're using too much power and you're losing too much water and then when you're done and you turn it off you have uh, a quicker drop in steam and heat so that that's when you would get siphoning so I just wanted you to see, this is not a lot of activity going on to keep your canner at the proper uh, pressure. Well, here we go. Our 75 minutes is up. Not much to do right now. Just turn it off. Turn off the timer and the heat. And we'll wait. Well, we've waited and our gauge is down to zero you don't want to touch it till then you never do anything to speed it up with all americans that last little bit of steam has to have a little bit of help but you always wait until this goes to zero and I, that may be true of miros and prestos too i don't know uh, but you never want to just take that off you never want to just take the weight off We'll let the steam escape very slowly. Now, don't do this before your gauge is at zero. You can hear that last little bit of steam. It's all gone. Now, you take your weight off and you wait an additional 10 minutes. And all of this is about trying to avoid uh, siphoning. Now while, I'm, while we're waiting, I'll tell you this. All of these little periods of waiting that we have done, waiting for it to vent, waiting for it to come up to pressure, now waiting for it to cool down, and waiting to take off the lid. All of these are figured into your safe canning time. It's not okay to cut corners on those. Um, when the, the testing is done and the safe canning time is figured, uh, the, it's calculated 
how long at what heat it's necessary to kill off botulism spores uh, and, and other possible contaminants, but pressure canning is mostly about making your food safe from botulism. And if you follow the directions, it is. You, you shouldn't be afraid. I know a lot of folks have fears of pressure canners or of canned food, but you shouldn't be. This is tested thoroughly. And while there is some margin for error, I wouldn't count on a margin for error. You want to follow the instructions the way they're written and the way they've been tested. I have often been chided for being a fear monger because I will openly and care, care, openly talk about botulism, not because I think you should be afraid of it, but because I think you need to be aware of the ways to avoid it. Um, and when I do pressure, can, uh, pressure canning videos, or when we talk in the group, uh, Safe Canning by the Book on Debbie's Back Porch, that's always in our mind. Uh, being fully informed is a way to not have irrational fears and to follow safety steps so that there's nothing to be afraid of. So we're waiting this last 10 minutes. I've set the timer and then we'll come back and we'll finish up the process. Well, our 10 minute wait is over. And we're going to open this up and see what we've got. Uh, let me give you a little bit better view. Okay. All American opens with the bolts. They get pretty hot. As with all canners, open it away from you because the steam will come out in your face if you don't otherwise. Fog up your glasses. Okay, we're going to take them out now. I always set them on a pad or a dish towel to protect them a little bit. And we're going to see what we've got. You remember I told you it will make its own broth even if you use water. And if you look, you can see that beautiful broth. As it bubbles away. Uh-oh, I dropped one over in the canner. It may, it may end up not stealing. Darn. Let me get it out. I don't actually think I've ever done that before. I'll put this one sort of to the side so I'll know. If it doesn't seal, that's why. There's one more step when you're using Tatler lids, and I'll show it to you. If you remember, we backed off of the lid just a little when we were packing them up, and so now we tighten it back. always do this with a dish towel uh, move it a little. 
or something to protect your hands. Because you see this is really hot. And this one that I dropped, the tight knit. I hope it seals anyway. Okay, the rest of the process is I will let these sit undisturbed for 24, 12 to 24 hours and then I will take the rings off and I will check to make sure that they're solidly sealed. If something is not sealed I can process it again as long as I check within that time frame, 12 to 24 hours. Or I can refrigerate it and eat it uh, right away. I think they'll all seal. They usually do, uh, except perhaps for that one that I tipped over. It's possible that some fat got up under the seal and it might cause a problem. So there you go, canning chunked meat, hot pack. Uh, hope you enjoy and come back to see us on Debbie's back porch. Well, here we are the next morning. As I feared, the one that tipped over in the canner did not seal. Uh, the fat, I'm sure, got up under it before it could seal tight. It's in the refrigerator, but as you can see, these are nicely sealed, put away, ready for meals as the winter goes on and yes there's some fat on it when you can meat you want to get as much of the fat off as you can but you probably won't be able to get every single bit of it meat is pretty especially beef is pretty highly marbleized but this is sealed ready to go I enjoyed using my tattlers um, this is really not the first but close to the first project with the uh, new Easy Seal Tattlers and they did just fine and I'm really glad to use them because I hate having to buy lids. So thank you for joining us. I hope you give this a shot.